Our moderator for today's panel is Grace Tiao. Grace is an associate director at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. She leads a team of computational biologists developing methods and pipelines to produce and analyze large scale sequencing data. This work includes leading product for the Genome Aggregation Database, also known as NOMAD. This seeks to harmonize exome and genome sequencing data and is the world's largest publicly available database of human genetic variation. With that, Grace, take us away. Thanks so much, Megan. Welcome everyone to our very first session of WIDS Cambridge 2021. We have an all-star panel of women leaders in machine learning who are assembled this morning to talk to us about the state of the field and its applications for healthcare and to answer your burning questions on this topic. Healthcare is a subject that has taken on special urgency and importance this last year, and we've all been witness to truly historic achievements in data sharing, um, rapid data sharing, international collaborations on viral genomic surveillance and host genetics research, large scale COVID-19 testing and vaccine development, even as we've witnessed at the very same time, the continuing challenges that our country faces in addressing racial disparities in healthcare delivery, sustaining a robust public health infrastructure and coordinating activities across a, a highly decentralized healthcare system. And this past year, we've experienced in a visceral way, the power and importance of effective, efficient, and affordable healthcare for the functioning of human society, which makes the application of ML in healthcare an unparalleled opportunity for those of us who are interested in data science and medicine to make meaningful contributions to our communities and to the world. We are living in a moment in which novel technologies have made it possible for us to collect a truly enormous wealth of data, including medical and imaging, proteomics, genomics, metabolomics, electronic healthcare records, and data from wearable devices, even at the same time as major algorithmic advances in machine learning and the democratization of open source software have really opened up new avenues for more people to explore and draw insights from this data in new ways. I can speak from my own experience over the last few years watching my host institution, the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, as they've invested in the development of ML approaches for healthcare through the ML for Health initiative in our data sciences platform. And we've recently recruited the Pyro team to the Broad, which is a group that develops open source software to, develop, uh, to support deep universal probabilistic programming in Python. Now, the goal of our ML for Health initiative is to apply machine learning to investigate the genetic underpinnings of disease and to improve disease sub-segmentation sub as well as risk prediction for the ultimate goal of improving clinical trials. But there are just so many more potential applications of ML for healthcare and our one institution can't address that alone. Um, and some of those areas include faster, more accurate diagnoses, the prevention of medical errors, and the early detection of adverse health events, as well as better prediction of health outcomes and streaming the design of new drugs, just to name a couple ambitious areas of research. So today, I'm really looking forward to hearing what our panelists are actively working on in this field, as well as their views of what the greatest opportunities and challenges um, in the field are today. So with that, let me turn to our panel and briefly introduce each of our speakers. First, we have Hilary Finucane, who is co-director of the program in medical and population genetics at the Broad and a faculty member in the analytic and translational genomics unit um, at Med Mass General Hospital. Her research focuses on integrating genetic data with molecular data to identify the causes of common human diseases. She holds a BA in mathematics from Harvard, an MSc in theoretical computer science from the Wiseman Institute, and a PhD in math applied math from MIT, where she has developed a new novel, uh, novel method called LD score regression, which has been widely adopted since its initial publication in 2015 by the genetics community 
to estimate heritability and the genetic correlation between traits. She's also a Schmidt, a Schmidt Fellow at the Broad Institute and has received an NIH Director's Early Independence Award. So welcome, Hillary. Next, we have Marzia Gassini, who is currently Assistant uh, Professor at the University of Toronto in Computer Science and Medicine, where her research spans a wide range of topics in ML, which include learning meaningful lower dimensional representations of healthcare data, interpreting behavioral data collected by non-invasive devices, and evaluating clinical interventions outside of randomized control trials. She is also a Vector Institute for AI faculty member and holds a Canada CIFAR AI chair as well as a Canada research chair. Unfortunately for Canada, she will be joining MIT's Institute for Medical Engineering and Science and Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department in July of this year. So welcome back to Cambridge, Marcia. Thank you. Um, and in 2018, she was named one of the MIT Technology Review's 35 Innovators Under 35 for work developing ML algorithms that take a really diverse stream of clinical data to predict things like the length of hospital stays, the probability of death, and the need for various clin clinical interventions during a patient's stay. She holds a bachelor's in computer science, electrical engineering, and math from New Mexico State University, an MSc from the University of Oxford in biomedical engineering, and an, a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, where she claims her most lasting legacy has been the creation of Muffin Mondays, which is a week a weekly opportunity for MIT's graduate community to bond over treats from Boston's famous flower bakery. And that's a tradition that's still carried on today in MIT's computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory. Welcome, Marcia. Thanks. Uh, last but not least, we have Beth Zaransky, who as of this week is um, widely um, announcing her new title as Director Partner Technology Strategist at Microsoft where she is providing C-suite level thought leadership and is shaping the digital transformation for Microsoft partners with AI, ML, data analytics, as well as technical leadership across all, all of Microsoft engineering. But prior to that, she led a team as a principal engineering manager for the fast track for Azure team at Microsoft and was principal software engineer for Azure's ML product team, which was later reorganized as part of the responsible AI team. Um, and there she worked on GitHub repos that educated users about Microsoft's research on interpretability, explainability, fairness, and differential privacy in AI. Thank She's you. Been... <laughs> Sorry? I said, thank you. She's been um, an architect for AI and ML implementations on Azure and has won and has actually worn many hats as, um, at VMware, Red Hat Software, Avid Technology, and other companies throughout her 20 year career in software and hardware engineering. Her, she holds a BS in electrical engineering from Northeastern University and as well as an MS in computer science and engineering from the University of Washington. All right, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Beth. Welcome, everyone. So I'll kick things off with an opening question, but I want to encourage any of you in the audience with a question for our panel today to type it in the Q&A box, and we'll do our very best to get to it um, in our discussion. So there's a, an exciting diversity of experience and interest in ML for healthcare on this panel. And I wanted to start by asking each of you to share a project that you're currently working on in this area and what you find exciting about it. Great, I'm uh, happy to start. Um, uh, so the field that I'm uh, working in right now is interpretation of genome-wide association studies. And so uh, one problem that we're working on right now is uh, if you, there's a common disease like schizophrenia and you're trying to understand the genetic basis of this disease, then you might do a study where you uh, look at the genomes of many people with the disease, many people without the disease, and, and uh, you can identify regions of the genome 
where it looks like there's differences between cases and controls. And so that's kind of a well-established uh, study design that folks have been doing for a long time. And now what we've got is a whole bunch of regions of the genome that we think are linked to these common diseases. And so one question that I'm very interested in is, um, there's often a lot of genes in these regions and genes are kind of the unit that are most interpretable and that we can um, uh, do follow-up experiments on and that we hope will lead us to biological insight. Um, but uh, the question is, which of these genes do we think is most likely, uh, if any, to be driving this signal? Um, so we've narrowed it down to a region. Probably one of the genes in this region is relevant to the disease. Which which gene is it? And this is kind of a, a fundamental problem. And there's a lot of different um, ways that people have thought about this before. Um, uh, you know, one question is, can we uh, you know, carefully narrow in on a single genetic variant that we think is uh, causal for disease and then figure out that variant regulates a gene. Um, and one uh, kind of direction that my group has been um, uh, looking at is, can we uh, instead of, uh, or to complement that type of approach, can we also start to look at a lot of data that we have about genes. So can we make some big matrix that's got, you know, 20,000 rows, one for each gene, and then a column with a lot of in metadata about genes, what pathways are they in, what uh, expression patterns, what protein-protein interaction networks. And so um, we're trying to cast this kind of fundamental uh, 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 question as something that can we can then start to tackle with prediction tools. Can we put together everything that we uh, know about genes into a matrix and then use that to train a predictor that will start to give us a sense of which types of genes are more and less important for, for this disease on the basis only of the genetic signal. Um, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop there, um, but that's the, the flavor of thing that, uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, Grace, I think you're muted still. Um, I'd also like to add, I didn't, um, since it's the first time I'm speaking, that I really appreciate the hosts uh, both for organizing this session and for uh, inviting me to speak and that I'm really excited to be here at this event with you all. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so the research that I think is uh, taking most of my time right now is trying to understand the interplay of the trade-offs that we have in machine learning models when we're taking a set of uh, electronic healthcare records or EHR data and trying to predict some outcomes. So in prior work during my PhD, I did some, some projects where we were looking at EHR records and whether they could predict outcomes that we think are clinically important, like whether you will die, whether you need a vasopressor, whether you need a ventilator. And so the question is, are those models robust, private, and fair? And the answer is no, by design, they aren't, right? Like a lot of times when you look at um, out of the box machine learning approaches, they're not trying to accomplish these things. They're trying to have this sort of high utility, a high accuracy or a high, um, performance rate by some metric of performance. And so what we've been focusing on recently is how to make those models more robust, private, and fair in a health setting. For robustness, what I mean is, if you take a model that's trained on data from one year in a hospital, it actually does really poorly on data from the next year in the same hospital. And that can be because the reimbursement model changes in a healthcare system, right? We have something like the Affordable Care Act or because the population shifts, we have a wave of immigration or refugees, or it could be just because a new disease is on the scene. We have COVID and we've never seen that before. And so this is completely out of distribution. And so robustness is a really important property of any model that's going to be applied in a healthcare setting. For privacy, a lot of the sort of state of the art approaches uh, to, to privacy really focus on a framework called differential privacy. And so that's what Google uses when it uh, uses your data to do um, predictions of the next word. That's what the US Census used uh, this past year. And differential privacy is a framework that essentially guarantees that any data that is too unique will be noised and clipped in a specific way during the learning process of the, uh, the algorithm so that you, uh, if you have an adversary who has access to other kinds of information, they won't be able to tell things about you as an individual that might've been clear because you are the only 
Western Asian woman of a certain age in a certain zip code, for example. Unfortunately, when we think about what that means, what does it mean to be too unique? What it means to be too unique maybe in an image setting is that you're the only picture of a cat when there are a lot of pictures of dogs. What we've found is in a healthcare setting, it means perhaps you are a black patient in a mostly white patient population, or perhaps you have a rare disease. And so the only patient records that are getting clipped and noised and therefore losing influence in the model classification are minority patients, minority in terms of demographics and minority in terms of label. And that's probably not what we want. It's fine in other settings maybe, but that's not what we want in a health setting. Same with robustness. And finally, for fairness, trying to understand how we define practical, pragmatic fairness uh, in a way that models can perhaps optimize, but also that are palatable in a healthcare setting. What I mean by that is when we look at definitions of algorithmic fairness, often they're based on equalizing odds or other ratios within a setting. And so for example, uh, the problem is we can't just say, you can't use um, underlying demographics as part of your prediction because we know there's probably a higher incidence of breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. And so that protected information, it's fair to use it. We should be able to use it in some ways. But we probably don't want to have a, a race sort of token that's used by the algorithm for uh, operations or for treatments that have traditionally been denied to minority patients or just biased in general in minority groups. So for example, if there's a history of over or under treatment of black patients with diabetes, we probably don't want to learn based on historical EHR data because that's where the bias comes from, the historical EHR data, and then operationalize that rule. And so here we're in a situation where we have a lot of labeled expert data, but we know that the expert labels were very biased in the past. They could still be biased now. And so we have to be able to question, when is it fair to include these biased judgments by experts in the past? And so those are some of the questions that my group is working on now. I have so many follow-up questions, Marcia, but maybe we'll bookmark those um, and have Beth go, and we'll see what other questions roll in from the audience. All right. Thank you, Grace. And thank you for having me here. I have always enjoyed the Women in Data Science Conference, and I'm really pleased to be able to be on the panel today. So I have a, a bit more of an industry slant. I work with a lot of companies that are doing some of the things that Hillary and Marzia have spoken about. And whenever I hear about the great work that Hillary is doing, or I hear what Marzia has just mentioned, my first thought is always about the data. And my experiences with companies and research for the data is that people are so focused on the end goal that they want to get to, that they miss a number of the items that you just heard about um, in terms of fairness, in terms of overall doing the right thing frequently is inadvertently overlooked. And so I feel very fortunate because I was recently on some responsible AI projects for interpretability and fairness. And one of the projects was differential privacy of the type that was mentioned, but I feel very fortunate because now I've been able to share that with a lot of data scientists who were not aware of potential opportunities that they could take some tools to give them some insights that start with not only why did my model make this mistake, but how can I improve my model? And even as far as does my model discriminate? Because I can tell you, if you're not mindful to step back and think about that, there are inadvertent side effects that happen all the time. There's things that you don't expect. There's things that we really need to put in place because in healthcare, it is so much more important than other areas. Everybody's heard about credit fairness and this fairness and things of that nature. Healthcare is so much more important when it comes to that. There's regulatory compliance issues that companies are using data and using ML without necessarily 
being able to even tell if they're compliant. And when you come to high risk applications like health, it's even more important. So I find that I find that I was very fortunate because I got to work on some of those projects with Microsoft Research and actually share that info with some other companies. And that's been very gratifying. And in fact, there, there's a book I'd like to plug because I read it recently and I found it, it really was an eye opener. It was called Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men by Carolyn Creado Perez. And it is really eye opening of biases in data and it really gives insights into things that as data scientists and in working in this field that we should give more thought to and we should be more mindful to. So I'll share the link later, but I do recommend reading it because it is an eye opener. All right, thank you. Thanks, Beth. Um, so just a quick follow up since um, both Marcia and Beth touched on the question of fairness. It strikes me that many of these questions have to be answered in a, a social, uh, in a community setting um, and will require input from a variety of disciplines, not only um, including the data scientists who work with the data, but also um, with um, community stakeholders, bioethicists um, and clinicians. And I wonder if you have thoughts on how we can better set up our current organizational structures, whether it's in industry or in, in, the, um, in academia, to have those types of conversations in a meaningful way. So, so I have some very strong thoughts on this area, if you don't mind. And in fact, I volunteered to work with some of the um, in an AI rotation program in Microsoft where we were helping people learn this. And I really think it's important to get more breadth in terms of as a data scientist, learning some of the software bits you need to have so that your projects are end-to-end -end viable. I think it's important for software engineers to gain more knowledge in data science so that they don't make some of these inadvertent mistakes. And then when they're more when they're better versed in this breath, then it means that they can step back and be more mindful about some of the bigger issues that are not necessarily obvious. And so my recommendation is to gain more breath in additional areas to help with that. Great, thanks Beth. Any other thoughts from the panel? Um, I think that if you want to engage other stakeholders, uh, specifically my experiences on the, the clinical side and then a little bit on the policy side, you really have to understand what they value. Uh, the clinicians do not care that your fancy model has this many bells and that many whistles. They'll ask really practical questions like, how many times is it going to false alarm per hour? Hmm. because I'm dealing with a lot of alarms in the ICU. Can you have it hold all alarms until morning rounds? Because it's actually really disruptive to ping me overnight. Can you, like there, there are really practical considerations that they have, right? Um, and I think if you, if you don't, if you're not aware of those things, then it can be really hard to design a system that's going to work well in a clinical setting. Um, I think uh, also if we're talking about the policy side, I'm very pro regulation for what it's worth of uh, technology and machine learning. I, I think it would be fantastic if there were uh, standards that were set prior to deployment of AI models, right? You need to evaluate on, on at least this many people. It needs to have at least this many uh, women and at least this mixture of minorities. Um, and so I think one of the things I try to do also, and I encourage others to do, is to try to engage with regulatory bodies like the FDA um, or even you know, speak with the NIH for when they're preparing sort of grant calls, because that way we're influencing uh, what they know they're looking for, right? Because I think if we don't have good regulation, we risk having algorithms that aren't checked, not out of even malice, 
just, I wasn't thinking about that, you know, and I don't want naivety to end up with, uh, you know, sort of result in this end product where we have models or systems or technology that only works for a very specific group of people. Thank you. It sounds like a, um, there's a great deal of work still to be done. Um, so let me switch gears a little bit because we have a, a popular question that's bubbling up to the top from the audience. Um, Alexandra writes, um, what are some of the most poignant um, challenges and promising strategies for mapping highly quantitative data, such as genetic data, biometrics, or physician visit statistics uh, with qualitative data? such as patient experiences of pain or trust in medical practitioners. Any thoughts on quantitative and qualitative linking? It's, it's not my work, but if people have read uh, Emma Pearson's recent paper on uh, knee x-rays that came out in Nature Medicine, um, where she takes uh, a, 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 a an established uh, openly available NIH uh, x-ray data set of patients' knees. And then there's two scores there. There's uh, the acknowledged clinical score, the KLG score, that's supposed to be the objective measure. A bunch of radiologists made it for how badly your knees are doing and whether you need a surgery. And then she also takes the patient's self-reported pain score, their COOS pain score. And it's been known forever since these scores were uh, created decades ago that there's a, uh, a lack of correlation between your COOS pain score, the pain you report, and the KLG score, but only for the poor patients and the black patients. And so the argument has been, well, this is confounded by the environment, maybe poorer patients or patients who uh, experience systemic racism, they just have worse lives. And so they're reporting more pain in general. They're just experiencing more general pain. It's not that their knees are actually in more pain. And so Emma has this uh, great paper where she uses machine learning. She uses convolutional neural networks to close the gap between those two scores, just using the knee x-rays. So it's not in their heads. It's not as if there is some magical, you know, oh, our lives are really hard for these patients. It's that you designed a clinical score that only works for some patients, right? And so I love that. And, you know, she now is able to adjust that and say, no, when we learn based on these, uh, these knee x-rays, nothing to do with anything else, right? These knee x-rays, we can close the gap between these two scores. And this new score that she's created is more predictive of whether you'll need a surgery later on ultimately than the KLG score itself. And so I feel like that kind of research project is really what we want to do, right? Where we're looking at qualitative and quantitative information and saying, medicine is not always unbiased. In fact, it has a really rich history of being biased. If we look at historical injustices, maybe we can try to address some of those and not just copy them. It sounds like you're strongly supporting a more uh, critical interrogation of, of the qualitative scores that people are measuring. Um, so uh, another question that's come in, um, shifting gears again a little bit, is um, a little bit more career focused. Uh, we have a question from Sharon. What steps would you all recommend for a data scientist in the tech industry who's interested in getting into the healthcare space? Is it realistic to do this without a computational biology degree? What are your thoughts? Okay, so from my point of view, I have worked with a number of companies that have a range of people working in this space. So if you want to do research, certainly there's absolutely a need for some of the work that you mentioned. However, there is plenty of really interesting work that needs to be done that does not require that. So what I would say is reaching out to some contacts to, in different parts of industry to say, here are some areas I'm interested in. What do I need to do to get to the point that I can work in this? It is a great first step. And there is a dire need for data science in this space today. There is so many, there are so many areas that could benefit from different points of view, different expertise, and different capabilities. So 
if you have an interest, there is absolutely a place for you. So I would say don't discourage yourself because you're missing this one little bit, because if you do need that for the area you're interested in, you can add that to your toolkit as you engage in that space, as you gain experience, because what I bet is when you start working in that space, you're going to find some other things that you get really excited about. And that that may modify where you actually want to learn and what you actually want to do. And so what I usually tell people that I mentor is pick one tiny step to take you towards what you think you want to be doing and then just do the tiny step. And when you finish that, do another tiny step. And then soon you'll find that you'll be in the direction of where it is you want to get. You'll have a little better idea. You'll have a little more capability. And next thing you know, you'll be doing exactly what you want to do. But if you don't take the tiny step, you're not going to get there. So I'd say pick pick a direction and, and start to go. I would absolutely second that. I think that a lot of the people that we see at the Broad being super productive in this space came in with, you know, computer science degrees um, and and without explicit training in in biology. Um, But I'd also flag that, you know, healthcare uh, is super broad, especially if you're including uh, computational biology in that in that category. And so I totally agree with Beth and um, that, you know, uh, getting a sense for which types of problems or which which subfields within that enormous space are most interesting. Um, for example, I know that there's a lot of uh, I know there's a lot of resources from a lot of places. For example, the Broad has um, a bunch of talks on YouTube, um, and so if some of those talks are very interesting, and then others of those talks are are less interesting, or if uh, you know if it turns out that the more basic biology is uh, not the direction, instead it's some other direction. You know, there's uh, I think getting a sense for what you're most interested in is, uh, I, I totally agree with Beth, is a good um, first step. When, and one follow-up there, there are plenty of open source projects that you can get involved with. Um, Harvard, Microsoft, and others have an open DP um, GitHub repo for differential privacy. Uh, my colleague, Sarah Bird, has led an effort with Microsoft's AI for Health that uses that. If you become active in these GitHub repos, doing some basic either software engineering or data science contributions, you'll get recognized. And frequently people reach out to folks who are active in the GitHubs and say, hey, do you wanna come join our team working on exactly what you're interested in? Um, We have a repo on interpretability, fairness, and it's not just Microsoft, these are community collaborations that you can get involved with in your spare time and kick the tires and say, is this something I want to do? And to make connections with people actually working in this. So I'd say, you know, look look around the, there are plenty of opportunities like Hillary said. Speaking of opportunity, uh, I'm wondering what you all think are the areas in ML where we have the most opportunity to improve or to make significant advances. Um, Or another way of framing this is, is what should be our stretch goals as um, a field, um, as opposed to, you know, working on things that we can do fairly well currently. So I have uh, one thought about that, you know, as it applies to my particular field, which is um, the things that I've, seen that that seem to be most tractable are when the problem is super well defined, especially if there's good gold standard data, a really good way to tell whether your things are working or not. And that seems to me like, uh, you know, being able to find very neat problems within biology that you can then cast as uh, a straight machine learning problem are actually pretty rare. And so to me, the big challenge has to do with the interface of the two communities and um, how can you identify the places where machine learning is going to be the most impactful, but then also from the machine learning side, uh, figure out um, how to think creatively about gold standard sets or evaluation metrics or or things like that. Um, And uh, uh, how to move beyond the, uh, the bounds of just the problem statement as it is right now to continue to evolve. What what does the problem statement need to be in order for it to be most effective? 
Um, and so for me, I think uh, identifying problems, adapting the, the description of the problem as you understand more and more about the space and then getting better at figuring out whether you've solved it or not. Like those are kind of uh, some of the places where I see the most challenges here. Sounds like we need to start having positions for people to think about how to define these problems mm -hmm. as a discipline in and of itself. Um, so we have a, a popular question from the audience from Claire. Uh, regarding bias in medical data, have you all seen any instances of good data documentation that describes the demographics of individuals who are represented in that data set? I actually think this is more common now. I think it's it's significantly more common to expect a table one uh, for data in a paper that comments on the distribution of at least the uh, ethnicity and age and gender of the individuals in your study. Um, but I, I think that's a very um, US centric statement, right? I'm, I'm talking about uh, U.S. data sets and U.K. data sets. So like the U.K. Biobank, the All of Us data set, the Mimic data set. Um, in Canada, they don't record race in medical data. They don't have self-reported race, right? They, they just don't do it. Um, same thing in France. And so uh, you can't even check in some countries whether more Black women die in childbirth than white women which we know is true in places that record race because they don't know who is black and who is white uh, in these other countries. And so I think the level of reporting is also proportional to the level of understanding in the ambient society about whether uh, it, that information is needed and how important it is for that information to be reported. So for example, I know uh, I was recently, I wrote a, a long review with some friends on ethical ML in health uh, that'll come out later this year. And one of the things that another co-author pointed out is that we very, very rarely have any information on uh, transsexual individuals at all. It's, it's never, there's no column for it, right? Like in most uh, electronic healthcare record data sets, you have sort of a column for race and maybe it's not filled in. We don't even have a column for that. And so if, for example, there are significantly worse health, come, health outcomes systemically for a certain type of person, you have to know that so you can audit it, right? Like we, having the information is very important because we do need to be able to audit. Thanks, Marcia. Uh, so I have a question that has, has actually come from behind the scenes um, from our um, uh, partners here today. Uh, how do you all see the uh, he healthcare research um, focus changing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I can say really briefly, I'm not sure if this is what anybody else will say, but uh, I will say I am terrified by the uh, things that have become normalized under the pandemic. Um, I don't think vaccine passports are a great idea. Who do you think is going to get audited with those vaccine passports, right? The same people who get checked by the police, the same people who get frisked in the TSA lines, right? I, I don't like this idea that we need technology. Technology is going to keep us safe from this pandemic. No, it's not. We don't need machine learning algor algorithms to, you know, uh, facial scan everybody and see if you're wearing a mask. You need to send people masks and give them consistent public health messaging on how to use them. You know, we don't need to be giving a vaccine passport. We need to have better information on vaccination and an easy way for people to get vaccinated. I think I have been really uh, startled by the amount of surveillance that has been proposed during the pandemic under the specter of safety. Uh, and, and I don't think that it's going to actually make us safer. And so I worry that if we um, normalize, for example, contact tracing, right? And tech companies just push that to the phones. Why not, right? 
then depending on who is in government and what deal is done with tech, maybe I see that you're associating with other people that I don't want you to associate with, right? So we already know that, for example, the Chinese government has Uyghur detectors that detect whether too many of a specific ethnic group, these Uyghurs are in one area at a time, and that's enough to alert police to go to that area. And so I don't, for example, want us to be in a situation where we see too many black activists in this contact tracing near one another, and then that's used as a way to send police enforcement to an area. So I, I don't think that all these COVID problems are machine learning problems. I think that they are public health and societal problems. And I'd like to second what you just said, because even now what people don't realize is merely by carrying a phone through a shopping mall, your, your movements are tracked. What you stop and look at, if you have certain apps on your phone, there are things in stores that detect, are you looking at an end cap? So in that instant, they can send you a coupon because they found in a high percentage of the time, even if you receive a 75 cent off coupon, if you're in the moment of decision, it will trend you towards a purchase. And so like was just mentioned, we have to be very mindful of the side effects of that because if they know you're looking at a product, they know who you're with. Do you really want anyone else to know if someone needs to see a psychiatrist, if someone's going to say a clinic for something that someone in their family may not agree with, you don't you want to be very careful with what data are different companies getting? What data is being combined in that regard because as what was mentioned, there is a whole lot of effort going on right now because of COVID to justify things that can turn into really bad behaviors for us and really dangerous for our democracy. And so again, this falls into the, we need to step back and be mindful to look at the bigger picture to say, you know, what are we creating when we're enabling these things? And the things that we're enabling, are they really helping? Really? Or is there a safer way or a better way for society to implement that? And, and I myself, because I've worked with some companies where I've had some head scratching moments, I've seen some of that and it does give me pause. And so one of the things I have worked at a number of companies and Microsoft is trying to do the right thing. So as a company, I can personally say, I've been happy with some of what I've seen when we've had some companies we've worked with doing things that I would find questionable, I've had backing from the company to say, you know what, we don't want to use our tools for that. No, we don't, you know, there are, we have committees that will review that I can say, hey, take a look at this. And they will say, you know what, we don't want to use Microsoft's tools for that. Thank you. Thank you for your interest, but no, thank you. And I think we need to do that more as a society. I think it is extremely important for us. So I suggest, please keep, be mindful when you're working in things to keep that headset. Thank you. Beth, do you think that it's uh, mostly the responsibility of folks who are developing these algorithms to make comment on how they're used? So in my experience, they usually have very little influence. And in fact, I do know some people who have objected to working on projects. And because they're at a level, sometimes they don't know the impact of what they're doing. In fact, from a health perspective, there are some people who have more of a tendency to do things like gambling. There are certain medications that cause people to be more susceptible. Well, there are companies that develop algorithms to identify people who are more likely to spend money with gambling. And as a developer, I know some developers who said, nope, I don't want to be involved in this. And they walked away. Didn't impact what the company did. But I also know some people who were working there were like, oh, this is a really cool problem. You, you should see how I got this algorithm to work because they never did step back and think. So I think it's got to be a combination that, although I absolutely think there's value in legislation, what I find is when something has to be legislated, 
there will always be people who find ways around or try to find creative ways to avoid doing the right thing. So I think we need a balance. We need to have individuals who are willing to think about the impact of saying, it's not just that I'm making this tool. You know, if you make a hammer, yes, it can be used for good means or bad, but there are some tools that you know where your hammer is being used. So I think part of it is individual. And I think part of it is the responsibility of a company. And I think as a society, we need to make better choices. I wanted to quickly say, you can also be penalized if you speak out against a company, not even directly like Tim Nick Gebru, who was recently fired slash resignated from Google because she wanted to publish a paper that didn't say nasty things about Google, but said that language models often have biases and they're extremely environmentally expensive to train. So thank you so much um, for your commentary today. Um, I'm really sorry to, to say, have to say that we will have to wrap up our conversation um, despite all of the open questions um, which we'll have to work on together as um, a group of data scientists and um, as a, a society as a whole. Uh, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for a truly fascinating and um, really educational conversation today. And to thank all of our um, attendees for asking such thoughtful questions. 